All right. Good evening. Thank you. Let's open with a word of prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you again for the privilege to gather, to gather together as your people who are seeking to, to know you better, who are seeking to glorify you, who are seeking to be sharpened and to sharpen each other. Uh, Lord, I pray that you would help us. Help us now as we seek to understand you. And I pray that as we look to you, we would be drawn to you, that our delight for you would increase. Lord, I pray that um, we would not study you like we study any other subject, like biology or chemistry, but we would seek to study you because we want to know you and enjoy intimacy and fellowship with you and, and to worship you for who you are and not just some God that's in our imagination. So Lord, help us. I pray that your Holy Spirit would give us insight into these very um, unfathomable truths. Give me the, the right words to say as I try to explain very profound truths this evening. Help me to do you just the slightest bit of justice tonight. In Christ's name, amen. All right, so if you've been looking through your Grace Institute notebook, you will notice that next week there is no textbook reading. Yes, what? I am like the nicest teacher. So, so no textbook reading next week. There's additional scripture reading that I want you to engage with. But the reason I did that, and there's actually three weeks this semester where this is going to occur where it's mostly, where one week is just all Grudem reading, and then the next week is just all scripture reading. Tonight, uh, this week, as we st consider the incommunicable attributes of God, uh, is one of those instances. When we get to the Trinity, that will be another one, and when we get to the nature of Christ, that will be another one. So this week and next, I will be teaching on the incommunicable attributes of God, and then the week after that, uh, Vic Rogers is going to be teaching on the communicable attributes of God. So we're going to spend three weeks looking at what's oftentimes called theology proper, that is the attributes of God. And then we're going to spend two weeks on the Trinity, I believe the Trinity is after that, and then creation and providence and so on. I want to begin with a quote that was in your homework. It's by A.W. Tozer. I love this quote. It's a quote I th actually think about often. He says, what comes into your mind when you think about God is the most important thing about you. Now, why is that important? Why is it important? Why is it the most important thing? And this might be hyperbole, but why is it so important that we have the right understanding of God in our minds? Well, because it does not give God glory to worship an imaginary figure. It gives God great glory if we worship Him as He has revealed Himself to us, as He truly is. That gives Him delight. That gives Him glory. A lot of times, though, we are worshiping an idol, someone that we've made up, a God as we want Him to be. Maybe a, a sort of giant Santa Claus in the sky who only wants to give us good gifts all the time. And that's what comes into our mind when we think about God. That doesn't give God glory. It is crucial for us. If we're going to give Him glory and if we're going to enjoy intimacy and fellowship with Him, that we know Him as He is, or at least as He's revealed Himself to us. Any relationship is like this, Right? For you to have a close relationship with someone, you can't if you just have a, the wrong conception of that person. Or if you're, you're say, I, I do, you know, Tracy, I just love that you have blonde hair. And she's, what? Like, that doesn't, she doesn't delight in that because I'm just making stuff up, right? And, and that just reveals that there's not a closeness and an intimacy because I don't really know her as she really is. The same goes with God. Now, before we consider God, I do want us to take a step back to consider whether or not God exists. 
Does God exist? And to do so, I want us to consider six main worldview options that exist today, at least in our culture. The first one is called atheism. Atheism is the belief that the world is all that there is, just the natural universe. There's nothing outside of it. All that exists is natural stuff or the material realm. There is no God. Atheism, right? A is an, an alpha privative. Atheism. So theism is that God exists. Atheism is that there is no God. The second worldview is called agnosticism. Agnosticism is one click to the right of atheism. Agnosticism basically says, we cannot know if there is a God or not. In other words, they're non-committal. They'll say something like, there's just not enough information. Now, it should be noted that agnostics, we, we shouldn't think of an agnostic as someone who lives sort of 50-50, like sort of on the edge of, well, half the time I'm gonna live as if God exists and half the time you know, I'm not, and I'm just gonna sort of split it even Stephen. That's not how agnosticism works. Agnosticism is functionally atheist. They live as if God doesn't exist. Right? They, they live in the same way as an atheist would live. But they're not willing to make the strong statement, there is no God. Right? That's an atheist. An agnostic just says, not enough information. I can't make a decision. The third worldview is called polytheism. Poly is the word for many, theism. So polytheism believes in many gods. Lots of gods. Now, there's a little weird, God is sort of sticking out because uh, there are many branches of polytheism that reject a sort of transcendent creator God, an all-powerful God. They just believe in lots of different gods that are all limited in their power and mostly contained within the creation itself. You think back to the Old Testament um, polytheistic religions in the ancient Near East. The Canaanites, they were polytheists. One of their gods was Baal. Baal was the storm god, right? He controlled the weather. And, th and this is typically how polytheism works. There's gods for different regions of the world and over different concepts or, or activities of light. There's fertility gods, right? There's gods of war, storm gods, god for crops. All there's just gods for everything. Some people worship the sun. Polytheism just has many gods and they're typically contained within the created order itself. Although occasionally, that's why I have it kind of protruding out. Occasionally, some polytheists will say, well, there is, there's gotta be some God outside of creation that created, that, that brought the universe into be. A lot of the ancient, uh, polytheism used to exist a lot in the ancient world, ancient Greco-Roman societies. You've heard of Zeus and Jupiter and Mars and so forth. You see them in the New Testament, Artemis, or the King James would call her Diana, right? These are just, these are gods that belong to polytheistic religions. Next we have pantheism. Here we have basically God is the world, <laughs> and the world is God. P pan means all, so all is God. Everything that exists is God. Hinduism is, is, is a form of pantheism. Sort of new age spirituality is a, is a type of pantheism where there's a, there's a spark of the divine in all of us. There's, there's, de there's divi divinity in trees, right? Don't cut down the trees, right? There's, there's divinity in the, in the chickens. Don't eat the chickens, um, so pantheism just believes that God is in all and all is in God. Everything is God um, within the material universe. And what this necessarily entails is that the universe just exists eternally. Because if, if there is no God outside of it that caused it to exist, it must have just always been. 
So even like Hinduism believes in a sort of cyclical, eternally cyclical universe. And, you know, they believe in things like reincarnation and so forth. The next world view is called deism. Deism was a popular view around the, the time of the founding of our nation. Many of our nation's founders were deists. Thomas Jefferson was a deist. Benjamin Franklin was a deist. This is the worldview that says there absolutely is a God who exists. How else, would you, how else would you explain the universe? How else would you explain human rights and human dignity? But that God is completely distinct and separate and does not interact with creation. The analogy that's used is like a, a clockmaker that winds up the clock and then lets it go and then never interacts with it again. So God created and then just let it go. That's deism. And then finally, we have monotheism. Monotheism is that God is distinct from creation, but interacts with it. Right? It's not like deism where he's completely separate. He creates it, but now he, he, he interacts with it. Right? He's not completely disengaged. There's three primary monotheistic religions, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. We're going to spend some time thinking about this monotheistic God. And I, I am convinced that monotheism is the correct worldview here. Of course, uh, later on in, in the semesters, we're going to dive into why I think Christianity is the correct of all the different monotheisms. That, that's... That um, discussion revolves around Jesus of Nazareth, specifically. But here, I just want to take a few minutes to think about why monotheism makes the most sense, just from a, a philosophical and scientific perspective. We're not going to look yet at Scripture. We're going to spend a lot of time looking at Scripture in a minute, but monotheism would be a strong... Um, when we think about the, the creation itself, monotheism is the best, best explanation for a creation. Okay, now what do I mean by that? Well, there is very strong evidence that the universe began to exist. I don't know of any scientists that would reject that claim. The universe is not eternal. It doesn't just exist eternally. It's not just a self-existent brute fact, but there was a time that it came into existence. There's been lots of different discoveries that back that claim up. One would be Einstein's general relativity, where he, his calculations determined that there must be an absolute beginning to the universe. And if there's an absolute beginning, that means something must have caused it to come into existence. Uh, about a decade later, Einstein's friend, Hubble, uh, what was his first name? William? No. What was it? Edwin Hubble, yes. He, looking through his telescope, discovered what was called the red shift in distant galaxies. And, and what that told him was that the, the galaxies were actually expanding and spreading out. It's, a, it's very similar to the concept of the Doppler effect, right? Are you all familiar with Doppler effect? I don't know if any of you have ever been to a race. You hear the, the cars coming, and it's like, right? So it's, it's a high-pitched sound, and then it's more of a low-pitched sound as it's going past you. So when it's coming towards you, there's a higher pitch frequency, and as it's going away from you, it's a lower pitch frequency. Well, the same thing happens with light. As light is moving towards you, it has a blue, a blue hue to it, and as it's moving away, it has a red hue to it. And as Hubble's looking through his his telescope at these distant galaxies, they have this red hue to them, which told him they're all just expanding. And what that told him was that the universe must have had a definite beginning because a universe couldn't be expanding eternally. It has to go back to a starting point. Other things like the second law of thermodynamics, the idea that the universe is running out of usable energy. Think about a flashlight that someone turns on if it still has light in it, that tells you that it hasn't been running forever. It was turned on in the somewhat 
recent past, the universe is functioning the same way. There's still light shining in it. It's running out slowly and gradually. Don't worry, it won't happen until after we're long gone. But what that suggests is that it hasn't been running eternally. It started at a definite point in time. All these pieces of evidence and more point to a definite beginning in our universe. There was a creation event. And what best explains that is there has to be something outside of creation that causes it to exist. Now, within the creation itself, many people have found that the, probably the most persuasive evidence for the existence of a God is the fine-tuning of the universe itself. All these different laws of physics that are fine-tuned so precisely that if they were just off by one smidgen or another, one click to the left or the right, life as we know it could not exist. For example, the gravitational force is fine-tuned one part in 10 to the 40th power. One part in 10 to the 40th power. I don't, that, that's so many zeros. Um, to, to help us make sense of this, astrophysicist Hugh Ross says, to understand the odds of getting gravity just right, one part in 10 to the 40th power, meaning if you were to have that many clicks on a, a measurement and it's right on one mark, one, if it's moved one to the left or one to the right, life couldn't exist. That's how fine-tuned gravity is. Hugh Ross says, to think about those odds, picture a billion North Americas that are covered with dimes that pile all the way up to the moon. And in one of those billion piles, one dime is colored red. Blindfold somebody, <laughs> and they're able to pick out the one red dime in those billion piles that cover North America all the way to the moon. He says they have the same odds as we do of having gravity just as it is. That's just gravity. It's one part in 10 to the 40th power. I could list dozens of, of, the, of different laws of physics that are fine-tuned even more. The atomic weak, weak force, one part in 10 to the 100th power. If that was off just by a smidgen, the stars could not release elements necessary for life. The cosmological constant, which is that expansion rate of the universe, universe we were just describing, one part in 10 to the 120th power. And even more than that, and I don't quite understand what this means, but Roger Penrose, who's not a believer, I think he's an agnostic, he has, um, he's discovered what's called the original phase space volume, which is the initial entropy conditions in the universe that's fine-tuned one part in 10 to the 10th to the 123rd power. And if that was off just a smidgen, life could not exist. There's dozens of these constants. It's so fine-tuned. Life exists on a, it's just on a razor's edge. So there's a beginning of the universe, and it looks designed. It looks like there's somebody who's orchestrated all this and set, turned the dials all to exactly where they need to be for life to exist. I'll just mention a couple more things here. So when, when non-believers look at evidence like this, whether they're agnostics or atheists. They'll say, yes, there, there do appear to be these fine-tuned constants, but um, that doesn't necessarily mean God exists. The best, explanation, the best explanation that is often given is what's called the multiverse theory. I don't know if you're familiar with this, but basically the theory is that outside of our universe, there's a universe generator that is producing universes, and it's producing billions and billions and billions of them. So picture an infinite ocean filled with detergent and a bunch of bubbles, right? And each of those bubbles sort of represents a universe. We're one of those bubbles, and there's just trillions and trillions of them. And, and they'll basically say, listen, one of those is bound to be designed just right for life's existence. And basically, we won the lottery. We were the lucky ones. Right? So the odds, if you have trillions upon trillions of universes, one of them is bound to, to work okay and, and be suitable for life. That is, uh, to the best of my knowledge, the best explanation for our universe that we live in from a, a sort of naturalistic, atheist, agnostic worldview. 
All right, and there's other things too, like the existence of moral norms, the objective moral values of good and evil. How, how do we explain objective evil? Is something, is, is torturing babies for fun objectively evil or not? If someone says, well, yeah, well, then there must be some kind of standard that exists beyond human opinion. Um, the, the best explanation given by atheists and agnostics, those who deny the existence of God, is that there really aren't any universal norms. It, it's really all just, what does society think? Um, and so, you know, they'll say things like, you know, because most of society says this is bad, it's bad. Um, but it could be different. We, we could have ended up different. We, we could have come to different conclusions. So, so nothing really is objective. It's all subjective based upon human opinions. That's whether something's evil or not. I know I'm simplifying it a little bit uh, and so on. But basically, at, at the end of the day, I think the best explanation for the existence of a universe, it's fine-tuning the existence of moral norms, absolute good and evil, human dignity, why humans possess inherent value and dignity, is monotheism. I don't think the other worldviews provide a strong explanation for those facts. So, monotheism. <clears throat> the Bible teaches monotheism. Genesis 1.1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Not one of the gods created the heavens and the earth, but God. In other words, there's one. One God created the heavens and the earth. And as he says in Isaiah 46, 9, for I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me. So just a few minutes ago, we were talking about general revelation, right? There's general revelation. How has God revealed himself generally to creation? Well, now we're going to spend some time looking at specific. How has he specifically revealed himself in scripture? What's, what's amazing about general revelation is that you can know a lot about God, just generally. We know that space, time, and matter all came into existence at the same point in time. Meaning, whatever caused it must be outside of that. Spaceless, timeless, and immaterial. And whatever caused it must be personal to, to make it happen, to choose to make it happen, because there's... I know I'm getting philosophical here, so just stay with me for a second. What else is spaceless, timeless, and immaterial? Um, there's abstract objects like numbers, but numbers don't have creative power. So it must be some kind of mind, some kind of intelligence that can choose, make a choice. So spaceless, timeless, immaterial, personal, therefore to choose, all powerful to be able to create the universe. Um, in, in orderly, you know, in, to create a universe that, that works good because there's objective moral values. We can learn a lot about God, but not enough. Not enough to know him savingly. That's what the Bible is for. Steve Wellham says, we begin where scripture begins. The glory of the triune God who has always existed in the self-sufficiency of his own being as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Genesis' opening words remind us that creation is not eternal, only God is. And before there was a universe, the eternal God was there in all of his perfection, love, holiness, and fullness of triune personal relations. We're going to spend the rest of our time considering four attributes of God tonight. You've read about them in your homework, so this should be somewhat reviewed, but hopefully uh, some new things you'll learn as well. The first one is aseity. Aseity. Now, Grudem calls this independence, but traditionally this term is called aseity. Aseity means that God is self-existent. He's self-sufficient and is the source of all things. As you see there, aseity is from a Latin phrase. If you want to sound smart, use Latin words. Aseity is from a Latin phrase, ase, which means from himself. And this is hard for us to think about, but God's existence is not grounded in anything or anyone else. He exists in and of himself. God is un, 
caused. We, by comparison, are caused. Our very existence depends upon things outside of ourselves. Most obviously, our parents. <laughs> See, we are, we're derivative, but God has life in himself. Right? We're caused. He is uncaused. Right? So there's three parts of that de definition I want us to look at. The first is the fact that he is self-existent. Right? He doesn't owe his existence to anyone or anything beyond himself. He just exists. Exodus 3, 13 and 14. Then Moses said to God, if I come to the people of Israel and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, what is his name? What shall I say to them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent you, has sent me to you. I love God's name because it just sort of implies he just exists. I'm just there. I am. I am. If God owed his existence to anything or someone beyond himself, he would not be God. That thing that he owes his existence to would be God. And so and if God depended on something or someone, he would not be all powerful. God, by his very nature, must be self-existent. He's a necessary being, right? We're, we are contingent. We don't have to exist, but God is necessary. As John 5, 26 says, this is Jesus speaking, for as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son also to have life in himself. He has life in himself. We don't have life in ourselves. Life is given to us from outside of us. We don't produce life. We don't self-sustain ourselves. We are dependent. We're needy. Matthew Barrett says, unlike everything in this world, his existence is not grounded in, derived from, or contingent on something or someone else. His existence is grounded in himself alone. Here's St. Anselm. St. Ans Anselm says, God alone has of himself all that he has, while other things have nothing of themselves. And other things, having nothing of themselves, have their only reality from him. All right, that's just a, a very medieval way of saying um, we all need God. <laughs> what we have is from God, and what God has is from himself. God is self-existent. Next, he's self-sufficient. He doesn't depend on anyone or need anything. He doesn't need anything from us. Right? God didn't create us because he was lonely and needed friends. Job 41.11, who was first given to me that I should repay him? Whatever is under the whole heaven is mine. Acts 17, 24 and 25, the God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. Right? God doesn't need anything because he's the giver of everything and he owns everything. I could quote more verses here. Psalm 24, one, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and all those who dwell therein. Psalm 50, verses 10 to 12, for every beast of the forest is mine, the cattle on a thousand hills. I know all the birds of the hills and all that moves in the field is mine. If I were hungry, I would not tell you, for the world and its fullness are mine. That's God speaking. Again, if God owed his existence to someone or something else beyond himself, he would not be God. He would be dependent on that 
entity for his existence and therefore would not be all-powerful. God doesn't need us. As Jesus says in John 17, 5 and 24, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. And then he says, you loved me before the foundation of the world. So picture, if you can, the triune God existing in this eternal state in perfect love and harmony and unity and fellowship and happiness. This is what, this is what Scripture teaches. Right? There's this impeccable fellowship prior to creation that existed in the Godhead. Without creation, God would still be infinitely loving and eternal and just and omniscient and, and, and so forth. He didn't need to create for anything. Again, as Matthew Barrett says, God is perfectly fulfilled and happy in and of himself. He didn't need to create. There was nothing lacking, no deficiency, no loneliness, but he still did. And third, he's the source of all things. You are the Lord, you alone. You have made heaven, the heaven of heavens with all their host, the earth and all that is on it, the seas and all that's in them, and you preserve them all. God is the creator, right? Everything that exists, whether it's the spiritual realm, angels and demons, or the physical realm, the universe itself, God is the source. Everything owes its existence to God. All the, uh, especially the good things that we have. As James 1.17 says, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights. Every good gift, it's from God. So any good thing we have, we should give thanks because God is the source of those things. Revelation 4, 11, those angelic beings around the throne saying, worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they existed and were created. You are the source. You are worthy of our worship. Everything comes from him. What also comes from him are things like knowledge and goodness and beauty. Perhaps you've heard of the, um, oh, before I get there, Psalm 40, verse 14. Whom did he consult and who made him understand? Who taught him the path of justice and taught him, and taught him knowledge and showed him the way of understanding? The idea is that knowledge and understanding has its root in him, Right? The same thing is true with love and knowledge and goodness and beauty. So, as I was just saying, perhaps you've heard of the Euthyphro Dilemma. Has anybody ever heard of the Euthyphro Dilemma? Anybody read Plato? Anybody reading that for fun in your spare time? So, Plato asked a question. He is a fictional character named Euthyphro. And he asked this question. Is something good because God wills it? Or does God will it because it's good? And I've heard this question. Sometimes skeptics will, will pose this question as a sort of gotcha for us theists. Um, is something good because God wills it? Or does God will it because it's good? Think about that for a second. What aseity means is that those are false dilemmas. Those are false dilemmas. Again, if God, the, the first question, is something good because God wills it, makes goodness sound arbitrary, right? God just decided, and therefore it was good. Or the other, does he will it because it's good, meaning goodness exists outside of him. Aseity says this is a false dilemma. Something is good because God wills it, 
um, is partially true. Goodness is rooted in the, the absolute nature of God, right? So God is the source of good. Goodness is rooted in His nature, right? It's coming out of Him. He is the source of it. So it's not arbitrary because it's coming from a perfect being, and it's not outside of Himself. He is the source of goodness. All the goodness that exists in the world is coming out from God. He's the source, right? It's rooted in His nature. <clears throat> so it's not either or. It's, it's rooted in His nature, Goodness is rooted in the nature of God himself. He's the source of it. Also, with God being the source of all things, there's this idea that goes back to Aristotle again, that there must be an unmoved mover. There must be an unmoved mover. Now, Thomas Aquinas in the Middle Ages also picked up this idea, but the fact is, is that the world is in motion. Everything is in motion. And, you know, the dominoes basically are falling down. So there had to be a point when there was someone who pushed the first domino. There has to be. You can't just have dominoes going back up, standing back up, eat any, in an eternal direction, right? There, there has to be at some point a, an unmoved mover that, that gets it all started, right? And this is, again, going back to aseity. God is the source, right? He is the bedrock foundation for all existence, he is the unmoved mover. He's the one who pushes the first domino. He is the ground of all reality. That's God's aseity, his self-existence. Completely different from us because we're dependent. He's not. We we're derivative. We receive things. He's not. He's the source of all things, the giver of all things. Second, God's eternality. God's eternality. Definition, God has no beginning, no end, and no succession of moments. Perhaps you at your table were discussing these concepts and your heads were hurting. Basically, I wanna show you two options that have existed in uh, this discussion. The first is what we'll call everlastingness. And it's the idea that God exists on an eternal timeline that stretches back to eternity past. It never had a beginning, and it stretches all the way to eternity future. And God himself experiences a succession of moments from one moment to the next. And he just, but he just always exists. But he experiences time in a sort of similar way that we might. God has a, a past, a present, and a future. The other way to think of it, and this is what I think is the correct view, is God's, God is timelessly eternal. He exists outside of time itself. He's not bound by time. Because if you think about it, time bounds us in a certain way, right? We're limited by time. And time itself also suggests that we're constantly in change. Like we, we change every moment. By the time we started to where we're at now, you've changed. Maybe that's you've added new knowledge. Maybe it's some more skin cells have died <laughs> or brain cells. <laughs> Maybe you've gotten a headache right? We're just constantly in flux, constantly in changing because we are bound by time, but God isn't. God isn't bound by time, and therefore he's un He can be unchangeable, right? He exists outside of time. In, in your textbook, Groom talks about being able to see all of time at the same time, right? And so to look at 50,000 years from now, if the Lord tarries that long, and today, he can see them both at the exact same time as if he is fully present in each moment. And they're both vividly clear to him. And so in this sense, God doesn't have a past, a present, and a future because he exists outside of time. Matthew Barrett says, Since God is everlasting, his perception of time is not like ours. For us, we see one moment followed by the next because that is how we experience time. To transcend time is impossible for us. We are in it, bound to it, and formed by it. But with God, time is perceived differently. And one who is not bound by time or limited by count, he sees all time at once. Here, here again is Thomas Aquinas. He says, God sees all things together and not successively. Or here's St. Augustine. Thy present day 
does not give way to tomorrow, nor indeed does it take the place of yesterday. Thy present day is eternity. So all these church theologians from the past, they recognize God exists outside of time. He doesn't experience a sort of succession of moments like we do. He's not bound by time in, in the way that we are. Time controls us, but not God, right? As we go through time, we're constantly changing, but God doesn't go through time, and therefore God is not susceptible to change. Here's some just scripture texts that point to God's eternality. Psalm 102, 25 to 27, of old you laid the foundations of the earth. The heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you will remain. They will all wear it like a garment. You will change them like a robe and they will pass away, but you are the same and your years have no end. I love how the psalmist here connects God's eternality to God's sameness, his unchangingness, his immutability. We'll look at that more next week. This idea that he exists independent of time, outside, he transcends it, and therefore he, he doesn't change in the succession of time. Psalm 91 to 2, Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you formed the earth and the world from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. And as he says in Revelation 1 8, I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. So I think perhaps a, a, a more helpful way to think about God's relationship to time is to consider two concepts. God's transcendence, which means he exists above and beyond it and outside of it, as well as God's imminence. He's in it, or he can enter into it and interact with it. So God exists outside of time. He's independent of it, but yet at the same time, he can also enter into it and interact with it as he interacts with us, as he does things, as he answers prayers, as he, you know, as he um, sustains and, and, and controls all things. Isaiah 57, 15, I think, helps explain this well. For thus says the one who is high and lifted up, he's transcendent, who inhabits eternity, right? He exists outside of time. He's transcendent, whose name is holy. I dwell in the high and holy place, and also with him who is of a contrite and lowly spirit, to revive the heart of the lowly and to revive the heart of the contrite. So God's, God exists outside time, but he also enters into it to interact with us, right? So I think perhaps this graph might be a little more helpful where God's outside of it, but he's also able to engage with it, but he's not bound by it. And he understands time from our perspective. He knows we have a past and a present and a future. He doesn't. Stephen Wellam says, timelessness does not mean that God cannot distinguish where time is in relation to us, nor does it mean that God cannot relate to time. God is not eternally static. He has fullness of life. So he's transcendent and imminent, right? He can engage with it and interact with it, though he's not bound by it. Number three, oh, simplicity. Simple. We were laughing at how this is called simple, and it's very ironic, because it's not quite that simple. The definition of God's simplicity is that God is not divisible into parts. Yet, this is how people often think of God. They think of Him like a giant pie, right? Sliced up into a bunch of different parts, right? One, one piece is holy, one piece is eternal, one piece is omnipotent and love and wisdom. We just think of all these parts kind of put together, add them up, and you get one pie, and that pie is God. That's not accurate. Right? That's not a true view of God. Again, here's Stephen Wellam. He says, an attribute is not something we attribute to God as if it is a part of God. Instead, Attributes are what God is in his entire being and perfection as the one God. All right, so God isn't made up of his attributes. He is his attributes. So, not a good view, right? This is not how we should think of God. 
This is not a perfect drawing, but perhaps something more like this. God is one, right? He's simple. He's not made up of parts, so the lines are dotted, right? Um, so look at the top there. He's holy, but all of him is holy. God's nature is he is holy, or he is eternal, or he is omniscient. Don't think of him as little, sl- these attributes as little slices of a pie, but each one is God's nature. God is his attributes. Again, Stephen Wellam. God's attributes are not abstract qualities existing independently of him. Instead, God's attributes are identical with his nature. God's attributes are identical with his nature. God and his attributes, and each attribute is identical to God's essence. He doesn't merely possess qualities. He is these qualities. He is, he's not just loving, he is love. I hope you see the difference. I have found this next uh, concept to be a helpful way to explain God's simplicity. So in the scripture, we see all these different attributes of God, and we tend to think that, oh, these are just different slices of the pie that make up God, when in reality, what these are are just different colors of the light that has been refracted by the prism of God's revelation to us. God is one simple nature, but he reveals himself to us in ways that um, look like all these different colors on the rainbow, if you will. So we can talk about God as he's holy and eternal and immutable, his aseity, his love, and so forth. In our making distinctions between God's attributes, we must never think that God's attributes are distinct parts of his nature. The divine nature is simple. These attributes are mere expressions of his perfection in different contexts. These are just different expressions of his simple nature, right? And they're just being refracted through God's revelation. And this is why they, they, we see different angles of it. The truth is we can't know God fully in his simplicity, right? God's, God's beyond us. And so these are, these are ways that God makes himself knowable to us. These are ways that God makes himself and his nature understandable to us. Perhaps different, one, one analogy imperfect would be to think about going to a baseball game, sitting behind home plate. You're, you're looking at the game from that angle. Some, play, some people might be sitting behind first base and they're looking at the game from a different angle. They're both looking at the same game, but they're looking at it from different angles. Those different angles can, are like different attributes, but it's the same game. It's the same simple nature. This is a view that's been taught throughout church history. I'm not making this up, and neither is Wayne Grudem. Here's St. Augustine again. God has no properties, but his pure essence. They neither differ from his essence, nor do they differ materially from each other. Here's Aquinas. God is in no way composite. Rather, he's entirely simple. Here's Irenaeus. God is not as men are, for the Father of all is at a vast distance from those affection from those affection and passions which operate among men he is a simple uncompounded being without diverse members and altogether like and equal to himself since he is holy understanding and holy spirit and holy thought and holy intelligent and holy reason holy light and the whole source of all that is good god's simplicity, simplicity is consistent throughout church history so we should not think of god as he's composed of all these different parts. We shouldn't think of him, for example, like a symphony. A symphony is composed of, of parts, right? You got the violins, you got the cellos, you got the trumpets, the clarinets, all these different parts that you put them together and you have a beautiful symphony. That's not how we should think of God, because guess what? That symphony is dependent on each part. Also, there's potential that those parts in the symphony could conflict. There could be a time when the violins are doing their thing and then all of a sudden the trumpets are like, you know, and there's, there's a conflict, there's a tension that exists. And a lot of times people think of God's nature this way, like, well, his holiness, but his love, and they're like kind of, com- they're competing with each other. No, 
God isn't part holy and part love. God is holy. God is love in his simple nature. This, this idea of being composed would suggest that there's an outside entity that's composing God and putting him together. Number four, God's incomprehensibility. I thought this was a fitting one to end on as we've been talking about very profound concepts about who God is. God is categorically different than any being, any created being, and thus beyond our ability to fully comprehend. I understand that as we're thinking about God's aseity and His simplicity, His eternality and His relationship to time, we're like, I can't even make sense of that. Like that's, and that's okay. That, that, in fact, if you could fully make sense of an infinite being, we're not talking about God any longer. Again, St. Anselm says, God is someone that whom none greater can be conceived. In other words, it's impossible to even think of a greater being than God. You can't do it. There's no quality about God that isn't maximally great. Maximally great. That's how people have thought about God historically. He's a maximally great being, infinite in his perfections. Literally impossible to think of anyone stronger, better, wiser, holier, more loving, more just, and so on. Right? So much so that he, he really is beyond our ability to fully grasp. I heard a quote one time that's always stuck with me. If your brain that's the si that is the size of a soda can can fully comprehend God, he's not God. I don't know if my brain is the size of a soda can, but that quote has stuck with me. Scripture is filled with reference after reference about God's incomprehensibility. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. His greatness is unsearchable. Right? We can't, oh, it's just, we can't get there. His greatness is beyond that. Isaiah 40, 28, the Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. Psalm 40, verse 5, you have multiplied, O Lord my God, your wondrous deeds and your thoughts towards us. None can compare with you. I will proclaim and tell of them, yet they are more than can be told. Like we just can't do him justice. It's impossible. I could go on here. Psalm 139, 6. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It's high. I cannot attain it. It's just, it's incomprehensible. Psalm, or Isaiah 55, the text we all heard so many times. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways your ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. I'll skip that last verse because that's our doxology at the end. Basically, God's essence is beyond the reach of mere mortals like us. It's beyond the reach because God is infinite and we are finite. Even though the finite might try to ascend to the infinite like Buzz Lightyear, to infinity and beyond, he never made it, right? He stayed in his little room, he bounced around on a ball and got on a ceiling fan and it looked to the toys like he did, but he really did not make it to infinity. There's such a wide chasm that exists between the infinite and the finite. Just thinking about when Moses wants to see God and God says, no, the finite cannot look at the infinite and live. It's like trying to look at the sun. Someone who tries to look at the sun straight on, their eyes will burn, their sight will literally be lost. So the proper way to understand God is through the, or to understand the sun is through its effects, right? Its rays warm us, its beams give us light, right? But to look directly at the infinite, no way, impossible. As St. Augustine says, we are speaking of God. Is it any wonder if you do not comprehend? For if you comprehend, it is not God you comprehend. To attain some slight knowledge of God is a great blessing. To comprehend Him, however, is totally impossible. And that's, that's what I'm trying to get at tonight. To comprehend Him some is a blessing. Let's seek to know Him as He reveals Himself. Let's try to grasp at Him as much as we can. That is a blessing. 
And it's a blessing that he has revealed himself to us. He wants to be known. Again, Aquinas, the infinite cannot be contained in the finite. God exists infinitely. Nothing finite can grasp him infinitely. I love this next quote by John Calvin. Baby talk. All right. How in the world is God, an infinite being, able to communicate with us in a way where we can understand? And what Calvin says is like, it's, it's a lot like a mother talking baby talk to a toddler. <laughs> That's basically what we find in Scripture. It's baby talk. It's God accommodating himself for us so that we can kind of grasp him. If I was having talks like this to a toddler, they would understand none of it. But if I go, ball, they understand that, right? Food, they under ball and food is how God speaks to us. He's accommodating us. Here's Calvin, he says, for who is so devoid of intellect as not to understand that God, in so speaking, lisps with us. God lisps with us. As nurses are wont to do with little children, such modes of expression, therefore, do not so much express what kind of being God is as accommodate the knowledge of him to our feebleness. In doing so, he must, of course, stoop far below his proper height. Oh, we read the Bible, and we're just like, God just is like putting all the cookies on the bottom shelf for us. He's, he's lowering it so much. The way he does this in Scripture, he does this in many ways. One is through what's called anthropomorphic language. Anthropomorphic language. These are descriptions of God using human characteristics. They'll talk, the Bible will talk about God's eyes. God sees things or God hears things. Talk, talk about God's face shining upon people or his feet, him moving, or God breathing, or God doing something with an outstretched arm, or God sitting on his throne, or God moving about, or God asking questions as if he doesn't know the answer. Like, where, where are you, Adam? Like he didn't know. This is anthropomorphic language. It's a way for us to try and make a little bit of sense of God. Again, he's lisping to us like little toddlers. Another way is through analogical language. Basically, what this means is there are descriptions of God that are similar but not identical to human characteristics. So a classic example of this would be that God is like our Father. Right? It's not identical to our earthly father relationship. It's just an, an analogy. It's a comparison. It helps us make a little bit of sense of things, but it's not quite exactly the same thing. That's analogical language. So, God is incomprehensible, but at the same time, He's still knowable. We can still know Him, right? There's a mystery to God, but it's not agnosticism. Mystery is actually a good thing. Agnosticism is a bad thing. John Frame says, God is knowable and known, yet mysterious, wondrous, and incomprehensible. As we saw last week, as, as Matt was showing us in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, what makes God especially noble is the Spirit living inside of us. As he says here, the natural person, that's the person without the Spirit, does not accept the things from the Spirit of God. They are folly to Him, right? The natural person without the Spirit thinks all this God talk is foolish and stupid, right? But the person with the Spirit delights in them, finds them beautiful, and the Spirit helps us to understand. The one way that we can especially know God the most is through the Incarnation. God has revealed Himself most clearly to us in the person of Jesus. As Colossians 1.15 says, for Christ is the image of the invisible God. You want to know what God is like? Look at Jesus. Jesus is the clearest expression of God. He's God in the flesh. I'm going to skip here because I'm almost out of time. I love this quote here by C.S. Lewis. No talk would be complete without a C.S. Lewis quote. He says, 
For my own part, I tend to find the doctrinal books often more helpful in devotion than the devotional books, and I rather suspect that the same experience may await many others. I believe that many who find that nothing happens when they sit down or kneel down to a book of devotion would find that the heart sings unbidden while they are working their way through a tough bit of theology with a pipe in their teeth and a pencil in their hand. My hope for you is that all this talk of God is just warming your soul. Right? More than a, as he says here, more than just like a devotional book that's supposed to do that, theology. As we think and contemplate the deep things of God, that it warms our soul and increases our delight so that we are drawn to God. We love him and want to serve him all the more. Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and inscrutable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counselor? Or who has given a gift to him that he might be repaid? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. You're dismissed.